Oh, feisty witches. That's us. <laughs> what are we talking about today, Chris? We're talking about black flame candles. The black flame candle. Well, there is the. The. Uh, you know, I've had lots of lots of candles made with, you know, the leftovers of a dead man. Well, on that bombshell, maybe we should begin, but start off maybe a little bit uh, more friendlier to new people that are worried about you uh, creating candles out of the dead flesh, flesh of people. So let's go for candle magic today. Okay, okay. <laughs> if anyone wants to ask any questions whatsoever on candle magic, then feel free to ask. So to start off with, candle magic and the we called this the black flame candle episode clickbait yeah. i know but the black flame candle it comes from that thing hocus pocus that thing that i hope thing. we're getting a sequel yes possibly soon um so in terms of candle candle magic why is it so popular because it does seem to be a hugely popular doesn't it I think partly it's the witchy aesthetic that kind of leads you in that direction to begin with. Right. So anybody that thinks they're going to go into witchcraft looks on Instagram and sees all these witches with, with candles and thinks, oh, I've got to start there. Yeah. <laughs> so you've got to start there because obviously that what, that's what it says to do. Yeah. So you've got to. Um, and then, yeah, and then obviously there's all that stuff about Scott Cunningham, the... Uh, the oh. The Wiccan the Messiah. Messiah of, the Messiah of Wicca. <laughs> the Wiccan Messiah. Um, okay. Hashtag Wiccan Messiah. The, um, there is that kind of part of, that's where everybody starts. And I don't think it's a bad place to start either, because, you know, going back to my, my, uh, my lovely spell triangle. Mm. Oh, we remember it, that from the first episode of Feisty Witches. Yeah. I spell so that. going back... Going back to the spell work triangle, it kind of goes down to you've already got the energy there. So you're only having to focus on the other two parts of the triangle because what, the candle what, is... What are, what, what are the uh, elements of the triangle again? So Chris is a wonderful formula for the creation of spells. Can you refresh our memory? So, yeah. So energy, focus, and then I think we decided on the journey, didn't we? Rather than intention. Yeah. Okay, so I thought it was all about the intention now. And if I think <laughs> it's all about the intention, I need to shut up now and go off and watch the first episode of Fausty Witches, don't I? Which I think yes. our friend Karen has put on YouTube now. Oh, we're so on we on YouTube now. YouTube That's superstars. dangerous. We could be YouTube superstars. Now, I think we've got enough Down people YouTube. sort of on the live stream now. So, obviously, again, guys, feel free to ask questions, but we are going to be talking seriously about candle magic now. <laughs> so, we've even made this little uh, this little altar kind of a setup for you to talk you through a couple of elements of candles and candle magic. So, they're quite exciting, isn't it? Well, yeah, very Blue Peter of us. Yeah, very, very, very Blue Peter of us. And here are the candles we prepared earlier. <laughs> There we go. The candles we prepared earlier. So, <laughs> so if I grab one, this one. Oh, those are marbled candles. We like those. One of our, the marbled popular. candles from our marbled range of candles. What I like about candle magic is when you talk about teaching spells and stuff, the reason I think it's so iconic is because literally you're taking something physical and you're making it disappear. And the act of actually burning the candle, getting your, I want, don't want to say intention, but programming it properly, it's a yeah. visual representation of how that happens. Definitely. The fact that you've got something solid, tangible in this world, which is your idea of what you want, the thing that you want to manifest, you're essentially making something solid evaporate and turn yeah. into that thing. So it kind of, 
when you're talking about poetic <laughs> examples of transmutation and stuff, you're turning something solid, making it disappear and turning it into the thing that you want it to turn into, whether it's more money or something like that, some healing or a hex or something like New that. New job or, yeah, yeah. hex. So what are, do you think there's limits to candle magic in terms of what it's able to? There, there are only limits to how much energy you can pull from the candle. Right. So obviously with our friends over in the hoodoo variety, they love to dress candles. So rolling them in oil and then, you know, anointing them with oil and then rolling them in herbs and powders of all sorts of kinds. That's all about adding extra power to the candle itself. Mm. Uh, I think that's the only real limit with them is what's, what is capable. When we're talking about spell casting, so I think that's probably the big thing that we, we touched on in the first one, which is there is a difference between, you know, spell casting, ritual and other kinds of magics. Um, but particularly with candle magic, I think the limit is... It's, it's your imagination and how much power you behind it. Yeah. Um, and there's, a, I suppose, there's somewhat a limit of what kind of varieties of spell candles, uh, you know, spell um, candle magics that you can do because they come in several formats, don't they? So, you know, we tend to teach the, the main two. Um, beyond that, um, I suppose there are lots of different ways of dressing it up, but they fit into those two categories, don't they? Yeah. which is either it's a candle spell on its own or there is some kind of container that comes with it. Like, I think the limit to what you can actually do with a candle is really the limit of the practitioner rather than the ingredients. Because what I tend to find is when you reach a certain level, you don't need the candle, you don't need the focal point, no. you don't need the physical ingredients to make happen what you want to happen. And at that point, I think... People just put away the tools, people put away the physical kind of aspects of magic and they just think, well, I don't really need that, so why am I going to use it? And that's why I think that spell work and candle magic, you can go as far with candle magic as you can with any form of spell work. So any form of spell work, if you're casting a spell and you want to include a candle in the process, yeah casting that spell that is only limited to what you personally the magical practitioner can do and the limits of spell work in general because there are many different types and forms of magic so you know it's not all about spell work magic um ma spell work can get you quite far but most of the time people tend to think of spell work as interfering with and make things manifest in the physical world. Uh, so it's kind of limits, you know, or what you see most often is physical things. So whether it's a healing, healing someone's physical body or someone's mind perhaps, or whether it's getting money or whether it's fixing a problem in the physical world, much of that is spell work. Now, when you talk about traditional forms of witchcraft with not necessarily witches, but mythology of gods and goddesses and such. The gods and goddesses don't cast spells to get things done, do they? They just do it. Well, no, they manipulate energy without, and they're coming from a court. You know, they're normally using the, their own power in order to manipulate. Yeah. And they are the energy source, um, which that is different. And I think I think some people get tied up with that of whose energy am I using when I'm mm. casting? Um, and I think that's where a lot of beginners go wrong is, well, they power the spells with themselves um, yeah. and forget that afterwards you've got to, you've got to get that energy back after it's repeated. Um, and you'll get, you'll, you know, we normally diagnose a lot of beginners bad spells when they're having the physical effects. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, we'll have to do one on diagnosis, I think, at some point. But yeah. the to keep on topic, so what kind of things do we use candles for? My the main thing I use them for is is space creation, like sacred mm -hmm. space. So I'm more likely to use candles as a kind of um, like the the mood setting on those kind of dial down um, those those dial switches on lights. 
from the 70s as a kind of once a candle's lit there's some sp that's the start of a space as opposed mm. to necessarily having anything to do with what magic i'm doing but more a case of kind of like candles are on that means shit's going down like you know like i think that's probably the most common use of, of candles for me mm. um is kind of manipulate it you know obviously i manipulate spaces in my normal day-to-day -day without the need of candles but in the evening when i'm on my on my own or with friends that's that's one way of manipulating the space um mm. into an energy that you want it to have predominantly what about you my personal go-to uh uses for spellcraft with candles is normally if i want to give someone the ability to switch something on or off or activate or deactivate a spell but i don't want them to have that ability permanently so you've got a certain amount of times you can switch this candle on and off before it disappears and burns out so for example if i wanted to prescribe from a herbal medicine perspective a um, tincture or something i know they're going to get x amount of doses at a specific strength out of that tincture mm -hmm. well if i'm giving someone something like a candle spell that i've created and empowered and i'm giving that to them and it might have a considerable amount of power so say some kind of destructive one well i know that i'm going to put the energy required to be able to do what that person wants and give them the ability to switch it on and off but at the same time when they've accomplished the thing that they're wanting to accomplish i don't necessarily want them to keep and you know have that power permanently mm -hmm. so if i created a doorway in say a magical object like a locket which you open up and then pull the energy through and use it then that could be a permanent thing whereas if i'm saying light this candle at certain times say light this candle when you're going through a, a job interview to make people think that the sun shines out your ass for an example well that may seem quite simple um i could do that in many ways i could create a magical object a charm bag or something like that yes eventually that would wing the energy there would wing but it would last a lot longer than a candle if i gave them a crystal or something like that and empowered that crystal and programmed that it's probably going to last a lot longer than i might want that to happen so particularly if you've got an unscrupulous client that you think is going to misuse the magical object you've given i think candles can be quite good putting it in a candle is a, a good show yeah. when it comes to teaching i think that candle magic teaching complete beginners is great just because it's so physically it represents that and there's such a variety of candles and they really speaks i think to people's psychology with the fire mm. and the, the wax the burning of something physical the etheric nature all of the different elements that go into it because you're not just talking about and solid like you say, gases. they understand what a candle is yeah so yeah you know it is it is like you say very visual you see it light you know there's energy building you can feel the warmth um, and you're actually watching the fuel burn up which is the candle wax so from a representational point of view i can kind of understand it's the perfect way to start yeah okay so should we give some examples of kind of the varieties we would normally teach yes yeah, so if we compare and contrast a couple of different spells and then assume that we're going for candles and using candles for those spells because a lot of this is going to fall into sympathetic magic so you can maybe have a little talk about that and then tie it to something physical because there are again you've got ceremancy as well so the act of candle reading and things so if i flip over to there we go can you still hear me Oh, that's gone vile. Can you start echoed all over the place? Is that all right? Yeah, that's fine. Carry on. Okay. All right. Go about your business. <laughs> this is a bit new, isn't it? With that. So, yeah, from, like so, I say, from a representational we have point of view. kind of set up. But obviously, the most common candle would be this your simplest kind of candle. 
because I don't know about you, but how much does the actual physical wax, so ignoring the shape and the type, how much does the wax factor in? Because this is just your usual typical candle. I mean, this one's been marbled by us, but these kind of things very much are the stuff that you would buy, you'd buy from your local bargains and more or your local, local supermarket. You know, do you necessarily need to buy a fancy candle that's been marbled? or anything in order to make your spell work. So the first thing maybe we should talk about is pre-prepared candles from witchcraft shops <laughs> that are pre-charged. Okay. It's like your Betty Crocker just add water, half of the work's done for you, you've just got to warm it up. So what about that compared to just your normal plain one that you get? So something like a Saturnine charged one that's been made by a witch a witchcraft shop mm -hmm. that's designed for a specific energy comparing that to just your general empty candle that you get from asda for example yeah i prefer wilco's ones to be honest okay well that's just then. because we'll imagine this is a they're nice well. they're nicely balanced the scents <laughs> are so i think the biggest i think the biggest part is people don't think about what candles are made of for starters um so when you're when you're getting something from from a shop most people don't consider what they're made of <laughs> Kay has just said never trust another witch to do your work <laughs> I, I i think that says something about k as opposed to um to all witches yeah perhaps it's, it's one of those in the hoodoo traditions um santeria etc it's quite common for people to go to a specialist wish which that they trust to make a certain kind of candle or incense and then um being quite loyal to that i know that one works and actually they put all their effort into designing their spell work mm. um the question is what what you want to do with it really i i i don't think i can speak for liam but i think he'll probably agree we tend to teach most people on a very intuitive level. So, you know, if you are going around selecting your candles, um, whether or not that be at Wilco's or Asda, or you're going into a witchy shop in order to buy them, you'll know if it's the right one when you're selecting it. The only thing is when you're then looking back at your spell work as, did I do this right? Or as something changed, um, you know, did that go in the wrong direction? At that point, you've only got your ingredients to blame. Uh, well, that and your uh, your planning. But a large part of it will be, OK, well, could I completely control that ingredient if I've gone and bought it from one place other than another? So, you know, a lot of these candles from Wilco's, etc., are probably made in um, made in India or, or China. So, you know, the question is, well, what how much does it bother you? where your ingredients are coming from when you're doing it. At the end of the day, a candle's a candle, depending on what you've done to it or someone else has done to it. If you don't trust that witch, then I probably wouldn't suggest you buying somebody else's uh, spelled candles. Um, we don't, I don't, I'm trying to think through what we've got on, on the website at the moment, but I don't think there's anything on there that we've charged ourselves for you in terms of candles. Mm -hmm. They're more a case of there. Not if it, it wouldn't be charged by us, but it could potentially be astrological. Yeah, charged for by, like <laughs> by energy without us. Okay. Um, so if you're talking about your cheapo one, obviously, like anything, you could go and buy a, a t shirt that might have a certain smell to it. You don't know what environment yeah. it's been stored in. All things pick stuff up, magically speaking. So a good witch should be able to take this, even if it was ten tainted and made by some slave that was having a bad day, you'd still be able <laughs> to get rid of that energy and replace it with the energy that you want it. That you want it to have. But the point is that normally, if you're someone that's buying from a witchcraft shop, so for example, this one, you're saying, I don't understand a lot about magic. I want to accomplish this. For example, I want to kill someone. <laughs> can you give me a, a, a spell that's going to assist me in doing that? Or can you give me a charged object 
that I can use for my candle magic. So you might select something such as this, which is a Saturnine charged candle. So the person might say, okay, I've got this pre-mix that I've made that contains with it the right sort of energy for killing someone. I can sell this to you. It's a battery, but it's a battery that the output has been pre programmed right to thing, a certain extent. It's the right sort of energy and the right output for what you want. So you're basically given that. You can go into any shop and you can buy batteries for your remote controls and stuff. There's lots of different batteries. There are lots of different energies out there. Think of the magical periodic table. So you can get that. The point of this is that half of the work's done for you. Now, the yeah. most important thing I think to remember from a beginner's perspective is there are jobs and spells and things, particularly spell kits, where pretty much all of the work is done for you and you've just got to light it and program it with what you want to do. The, all the battery part, the energy part of your triangle is already there. But there are other things which have useful energy in. So this, for example, is purely a specific type of energy. It's not designed to kill people. You could create a spell that was designed to do that and package that up and sell it to someone. But this one's designed with the energy that you would use. So, you know, that's a little bit different. That's kind of, I times think of it a little bit like preservatives. Your Betty Crocker mix, if you want to make cookies, you might be buying the cookie mix that you just add water. The just adding water is just adding what you want it to do, your intention. You're writing on it yeah. who you want to kill. However, there are other things. So there's, for example, um, baking flour or something like that, self-raising flour. That's kind of like, well, there's the plain flour and then there's the bacon soda all mixed together. So that's part of the job done. That part's done. Mm -hmm. So if you think of it in terms of it, there's levels to, you're just selling pure bottled up energy in the form of a candle here. When you light the candle, you can take the energy out. But then there are spell kits, of course, as well. Would you agree with that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not, um, yeah, I'm not disagreeing. I'm nodding along. You just okay. can't see me nodding along. So seeing um, as how spell kits should be fairly self-explanatory, let's assume that you're doing everything for yourself. So you're not buying something that's got a pre-energy in it, in it. So even if you're buying things and you're not wanting to use the energy that's already there, you know, so it is literally whether it's your standard candle from Asda or B&M or Wilkinson's or is something slightly fancier that you kind of like the look of because it makes you think, oh, green, I like the colour green and I'm wanting to do a healing and I like the idea of using green and white speckled because it looks pretty for a healing. You know, in terms of picking ingredients and things that you like the look of, there's that, but then there's also thinking of how you're going to be using it. So in terms of what size candle or shape or something like that, you might be starting to think about. So if you're thinking, I want to cast a little spell today to bring me some luck, are you going to be wanting that spell to burn all day? Yeah. In which case, if I'm going to do this before I go to work, am I going to be waiting for this to burn down in order to do it? Or am I going to select something a little bit smaller that will burn down when I'm having my cornflakes in the evening or in the mm. morning, sorry. So in terms of the approach, are you creating a spell that you switch on every day and that you want to last every and burn a little bit down every day? Or are you just doing a one time thing that you just want to burn and then that's it? So again, it starts to get a little bit more complicated because you've got spell sizes, of course. So in terms of spell sizes then, Chris, how do you select spell sizes? Is it literally a case of how much you want to use the candle? See, that's the thing. It's I would I find that, you know, even the most basic of tea lights can be used in order to do that. I know I know witches that carry um birthday candles yeah. in order to kind of burn their way through because they come in a variety of colours. Um, like. and they're over very quickly but me yeah. personally it really depends so i 
<laughs> I probably do what no witches normally do, which is um, I will use the same candle for multiple uses. <sighs> oh. Um, and just burn it for what I necessary because it's for me it's the case that I've charged that candle with a particular energy stream. Yeah. So I would just borrow that energy stream when I need it. Mm -hmm. Um. So at that point it might be that like with the Saturnine candle, there is just a Saturnine candle at home that when I want to work something that would be benefiting from that, um, I'll do the work with that candle lit. Like I said, I'm going back to creating space as opposed to spell candles um but no to actually go back to your question um, and obviously a bit more approach for the beginner um is yeah you you want to select with how long you want to be spending doing that work so you know if you're just wanting to charge a bottle or um you know complete where you need that spell to complete while you are there then you know even even those beautiful marbled candles are potentially four or five hours of burning the question is do you feel like the the entire candle needs to be burnt for it is that part of your magical timing um or is it not you know with the little ones that he was showing you those those are rolled beeswax they burn incredibly quick um so you know it's a case of they might only last an hour or so um but it really depends on what you're trying to achieve so different candles will burn at different rates different size candles will go through at different you know you might be planning a spell that you need to do every day for for seven days like a lot of these who do practitioners where they get what they call a weak candle and they will they will There's burn like a, a set amount candle. of it these yeah. are quite popular and with the glass that you tend to see. They'll but they'll mark down the sides of it. This will, you know, will burn for this long and then we'll burn for this long every day throughout a week. And if that's when they're kind of building up a charge of energy over several days, it really depends on the kind of magic you're kind in to achieve. Now, for me, that always goes down to a lot of the candle magic that um, I would do and would set up with people is normally a case of um, they want a quick hit of something. So in those kind of situations, I will always get people to buy, go and buy some um, some tea lights. You know, you can quite easily, um, you know, get some plain white, <laughs> plain white ones, <laughs> and then just anoint them mm. with oils or whatever. If you're a complete beginner and or you're, you know, it comes down to what your practice is, what your personal style is of work um you know if we were to go and talk about you know the differences between different kind of practitioners and what they would achieve with different things it really just needs to be part of how long do you need it to run for is this a you're just lighting the fuse and walking away kind of thing you know we could probably we could probably make some kind of disclaimer there about not leaving candles unattended um but at the same time you know is that a light it and then start the energy is just to start the the pro process off like a, you know where you're just lighting a fuse and then the fuses just run on for weeks or days or, or like liam said you've got one where you want to you want to hit it several times it might be one that you want to light beginning and end of the day it really depends on what you want to achieve with the candle um i suppose the next part is because that's why we're talking about kind of who do practitioner as um is candle reading so you know we obviously well, sell we specific ones the process of actually doing a spell for, and then the <laughs> candle reading normally the mistake they make is reading it after so doing your yeah. divination to see if your spell worked after you cast it when actually you would want to do that before because you're yeah. wasting a candle you if, should be forecasting not yeah you should be forecasting <laughs> is this going to work I'll look now rather than I've spent an hour doing this. Did it work? No, it didn't. Yeah. I've wasted my hour. Now, generally, unfortunately, the bane of our lives and existence is the spell book. <laughs> Within spell books, there are a many, a many, a many different spells that give you a formula 
and say, you need this, you need that, this ingredient, that ingredient, whatever, don't really give you the idea of how they come up with the formula. So, which everyone always thinks is a secret. So in terms of the most simplest candle magic, aside from a meditation candle that you're just staring at, essentially the charging and burning of a battery. So the programming, combining the energy. So in terms of something simple like that, you've got to ask yourself how capable you feel. And generally I think that going with the intuitive method of, okay, what do I want to do? I want to cast a spell for prosperity, particularly money, because I want some more money. So I don't have a lot of money, so I'm not going to be spending a lot of money on ingredients. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a super simple, cheap little candle. I might not get the white one because I find that boring. I might instead get a pretty green one. So in terms of your sizes and such, you would think, well, OK, how long is this going to go on for? If I get a tiny one, do I feel confident that I can add the energy necessary to that in order to make a big impact? So, for example, with this one, you'd light it and it would burn for an hour. And then the you'd have to put the energy that you want within this candle, com complete that kind of circuit to make it happen. Well, if you times that one hour by, say, seven hours over the course of yeah. seven days, you could be thinking, OK, on the first day, on my Monday, I'm going to light this candle and I'm going to burn it for an hour. And during that hour, I'm going to meditate on the money that is coming to me. I'm going to see the money coming to me. You're going to be using that as your focal point. So if you wanted to do that, you would probably select a candle that's big enough to run for seven hours. <laughs> As opposed to well, yeah, that would be fun, wouldn't it? One. You spend all that time burning an hour of time, and then yeah. you've worked it out wrong, and you're like, "Oh no, <laughs> I'm three days short." So that's the kind of meditation style that you're talking about. Now, very much of the the time with spell casting, you're normally talking about a lot of the the pre-made ones that you buy from witchcraft shops they'll be pre-charged so if you're wanting to charge the candle you're wanting to put the energy in the candle and the act of lighting it is releasing that energy so for example if you wanted and felt confident to be able to put energy in something can you want a quick kind of grenade quick fire quick release action then you would pick a small one because magical energy can fit in any size. This could be half the size of that, and I could still fit a lot of energy in it because it doesn't it doesn't really relate to the physical world in that sense. No. However, if it was something that was ongoing, so if this was a wham bang, thank you, ma'am, I just want a prosperity spell and I want this done and over by today, I'm gonna fire all of my energy into that, then I want a quick one. But if it's something that I'm going to want to work with continuously over the course of the month or something, particularly with healings, I think that's quite a, you know, a popular one because you're, you know. Yeah, you wouldn't, you you wouldn't wish normally to when you're doing a healing just this. kind of hit once. Yeah, you might want to give the energy, put the energy into this and give this the, to the person that needs healing and say like this every day for an hour or something like that. So literally that's just a case of you're charging the candle you're putting your intentions of what you want it to do you're telling it how you want that to manifest and of course the magical energy which we did talk about in the first episode so do you want to quickly go over the magical energy part in terms of how you might actually feed this candle because obviously there are herbs there are oils that you can buy, which again, that's no different than Betty Crocker mix that you just add into the candle. We had a recent yeah. one, which was quite interesting, which they were using emotion to power this. And I think that's something that everyone can probably get. So if I wanted to use emotion to power this spell, which I'm giving to someone else to light, to hex my friend's boss, so my friend comes to me and says, I don't like my boss. I want to hex my boss. What can you do? 
you could create a candle, put the right hexing kind of energy into that, even carve the person's name into it, and then give that to said person. So she or he could burn it, and then that would release the energy, which would, you know, we're talking about professional witchcraft now. The difference is, of course, yeah. is that if you're doing it for yourself, you're lighting it. If you're doing the work for someone else, you do the work, give it to them, and they activate it. They switch it on by lighting it, which is what you get really well with candles. Visualization, you can see it being lit and actually burning. Whereas other sorts of forms of magic is a little bit less easy to kind of see that unless you can sense energy. Yeah. So give like, me a if you're handing over someone some lucky spell. hair there. We're going to hex someone. Let's hex someone called a raven, Grimsby. <laughs> what would you do if I've got this red candle or the client's got this red candle? What would you tell them to do? Well, you know, well, you know what I, I'd probably do. I'd say kiss the candle. But, you know. Um, there we go. <laughs> but I'm all, I'm all for, you know, my brain automatically goes to kind of um, old Batman movies with Poison Ivy um you know and a, a proper kiss of death you know but that kind of really depends on where your brain takes that your inspiration from when you're creating so you know it would be a case of you know i'd put all that that kind of it really depends if we're hexing if we're hexing you know you will often say won't you liam uh hexing is a punch in the face like yeah it's not ruining somebody's life um, those are curses. Uh, a hex is a punch in the face. So if you're if you're going to what you're wanting to do is for them to feel that punch. Mm. So you're going to put that kind of raid in there that kind of is is over in a split second. Uh, you know, is a bang wallop. They felt it, um, and you're putting that into that candle. Uh, you know, like Liam says, you might be writing in its name in whatever. Me, I would probably then add, because I'm a psychopath, um, would add that kind of like, you know, seal it with a kiss kind of situation. Um, because I'd want them to then connect with that candle. So even if I've completed a work for somebody, um, it would be a case of handing it over and going, OK, well, I need you to be in this state of mind because that's how I've designed it. Um, when you light this candle, I want you to think about that person, what you want it to affect, you know, what kind of effect you want to see happen. And you just talk them through that bit, because at the, when you're handing someone a spell candle like that, like Liam says, it's a perfect little grenade. All they've got to do is kind of pull the pin and throw it. Um, you know, and again, when you're handing it to someone who's not particularly magical, um, and this is their first understanding, you'll always start with spell spell candles because, like you know, you can see it working. They're not having to visualise the actual and see, the, you know, the candle is physically there. What they're having to visualise is just the target or, you know, or the um, process that they want to see happen. That way they've only got to, fo they've only got to focus on one aspect of the you know or kind of you know one aspect of that triangle which is the kind of end goal uh, and focus just on that the rest of it is already pre-programmed into the candle you know and in that way the candles work the same way as a, a crystal or any kind of uh, part that uses the battery i think that's the best way to put it with a with a candle is they are a battery um so once it is completed and it's being deplete depleted it's been released into into the ether in order to go and um manifest yeah so if we compare and contrast two hexes then because we're a very naughty fasty witches and mm -hmm. we'll go for a simple one and we'll go for a slightly more grandiose one as well so for the grandiose one we'll start with that so in terms of selection of ingredients and things like that, this is the sort of thing that you would get in a spell kit. So we'll go for a yeah. kind of hoodoo-y option. And within hoodoo, you've obviously got the idea within witchcraft, particularly modern witchcraft, of colours and colour combinations and things. Now, do colours matter to you personally? <laughs> they do and they don't. So I, you won't find my colour correspondences anywhere else. 
Um, and I think that's an important thing for people to consider. Um, so, you know, for example, if I'm going to do a, an, an attraction spell, I'm definitely not going to use red candles. Um, you know, red candles I associate with, you know, um, sexual kind of lust or um, sexual energy. So I wouldn't I wouldn't use a red candle for something like that. If you're using attraction, I'd want a colour that attracts me. Um, so I'd want, you know, quite conveniently there, Liam, a blue or a, a green, um, because those I find far more appealing and would attract my eye. Whereas um, red gives me kind of like, you know, warning or the red lights on, uh, don't come a knocking kind of situation. Love. When on a battlefield, so, traditionally, you would see a lot yeah. of blood. Blood is red, therefore red anger. When you go red-faced, when you're angry, all those sorts of things. The colour red is very symbolic, sympathetic magic. So if I go and construct this little spell to hex someone, so we'll go mm -hmm. for the elaborate one that you'll probably be familiar with. Now, the first thing you would want to do is actually think, what do I want to happen and how do I want it to happen? And the best thing to do at this point is to grab some paper and a pen and literally write out as simply as you can what you want to do. So if we pick a random person, Raven Grimsby, maybe? Yeah, let's go with Raven Grimsby. What do we want to do to Raven Grimsby? <laughs> um, we want to, him to experience some kind of a pain. Yeah. So I want so, him to fall over and break his nose or something. Okay. So we're going for a uh, physical pain. So yeah. you could literally want, you could write the name of the person. Raven Grimsby. Mm. Will feel great physical pain <laughs> physical pain now i often say to put a kind of a start and end date to this kind of thing so raven grimsley yeah. will experience great pain well i've not said when so this could be in 50 years time i don't know how old raven grimsley yeah. is I don't, I don't want him to hit his foot in, in that, that long a period of time. I want him to do it now. Also, you might not want it to happen once. You might not want him to get out of bed and stand on a plug socket and hurt. You might want it to be an ongoing pain. So if I put something like Raven Grimsby will, not I want, he will, yeah. feel great pain, great physical pain over this next month what i'm essentially doing here is creating a battery to power a spell that will cause raven grimsby great physical pain over the next month now is this going to be a one single thing where he stands on a plug or he bangs his knee in the wrong place or his funny bone or something like that well mm -hmm. if you're going for over the next month and you're adding your ideas into, well, no, I want things to happen constantly. I don't want there to be a single minute of a single day where he's not in some pain. Is that going to be a physical disease or illness? How is this going to kind of manifest? Yeah. What, well, this is the, you know, the, the basics of what you want. But of course, if you write that down, you've got it clear in your head as to what's going to happen. But you can modify that. The amount of energy that you're putting into it is going to depend on the outcome because the spell's only going to be able to manifest what is powerful enough to manifest. So if I yeah. took something as simple as this and I literally tore the paper and as they always say, fold it up and popped it on my little dish. But who do people do like to use? What I could then do is I could then think, well, what is symbolic? of Raven Grimsby and pain. And I might mm. take a little look in a witchcraft shop and find a little bloody red skull candle. So I might take something like that and say, 
well, this is Raven Grimsby. This is what it, this is his ping. This is symbolic of his ping. And I might pop that down on the paper or in front of the paper so you can see a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Then what I might do is I might decide to think, well, where is my energy coming? Where am I getting the energy from? And you can decide, well, am I going to be lighting this? Am I going to be, you know, putting and channeling my rage, how much I hate Raven Grimsby, into that? Do I have enough rage to channel into that? Am I going to create sympathetic rage? So am I going to force myself to be angry when I'm not angry? In which case, how can you do that? How can you raise energy and make yourself angry? Well, why not use pain? Well, how do you do that? You yeah. can cause yourself pain by eating some mm -hmm. super red sauce. Old hoodoo kind of trick. You'll see that on, um, oh, is it American Horror where she eats the, the chilies and that kind of thing? You could do possibly, that. Possibly, actually, possibly. But at the same time, you could use anything. Now, a lot of the times what you will find with, um, uh, particularly in hoodoo and stuff like that, is you'll say, they'll say, well, you know, use extra ingredients. You find this with witchcraft as well. So they might say, well, what you need is you need to buy these magic candles that are hexing candles from me. So they'll say, buy your hexing candles, trim and cut the wicks, mm. which I'm gonna do. And then within the witchcraft books and such, They'll probably say, you know, you need to put them in the appropriate place. Little helper candles, I believe that they say, or they call them. So you'll normally get within such spell books and things, they'll say, well, this is what you do. This will be the formula of the spell. This is what you're supposed to do with the spell. Very yeah. Doing it. Um, and they'll give different ideas and things like that for you to do. What they'll also do is they'll give you things that you can add to your spell. So whether it's um, pre-made mixes and things, or whether you're creating your own mixes, for example, then you might also get things like that, which they tell you to do in spell books. Now, this is your kind mm -hmm. of stereotypical spell book kind of spell, because it's not as simple, of course, in a lot of these spell books as just go and buy a red candle and charge it. What people struggle with is that kind of a thing. They struggle with the kind of idea of doing it all. They need the extra help, which the extra help is the extra ingredients, isn't it? You can tell it's been a while since I've done anything like this because I tend to opt for the more. I was say, when was the last time you used one of these? Oh, so then I, do, I don't tend to use this hoodoo dish method personally because I find it. No, quite... I'm not. I'm not good with the dish method either. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of the dish method, so I'm just going to kind of cheat here, but there we go. So, very often you'll get this kind of idea of, well, what I need to do is I need to put as much ingredients and as much power into this spell as possible to make it happen. So make that's sure essentially it's what they're doing at this point. Within the spell books and things, they're kind of saying, add this, 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 and this, and this. And all of that power together is going to compensate for your lack of power. So if we think back yeah. to the kind of one trick, one use, you're empowering this and then lighting it, this is kicking it up a notch. So in terms of things such as this, what they would say is to add more and more and more power. So if you've got these mixes and things like that and herbs and other forms of power, they would literally say, this is a Mars mix a destructive mix and blend of magically charged incense and powders, they would probably tell you to do something like sprinkle it on and over it. And that's what you yeah. would generally get, is you would get that kind of a look, that kind of a spell, for example. Mm -hmm. And if you think about that, it looks very cool. It looks visually appealing. You know, much of what magic and witchcraft is nowadays is visually appealing, physical art. It's got and and nice. when beginners start, they kind of want that, don't they? Yeah. They want to see it all there because it gets them in the right frame of mind. Yeah. Um, you know, it gets them all in the zone about it and, mm. and allows them to kind of raise energy that they don't feel necessarily capable of doing without all the extra mishigosh. 
Um, so like, you know, it is a case of all that is there in order to make them go, OK, well, I know what I'm doing. I know what that does. I know other candles there. I know other schools there. I know what my petition bit says. Uh, you know, I know I've got the incense and I've I've, I've taken some of the uh, I've taken some chili powder and made sure it's extra spicy. And then I've actually taken the actual hot sauce in order to get myself into a real rage because I'm really not good with spicy things. Um, and then, you know, to get you all into those parts, what you then start to do as you get better at this is you strip things away that you kind of like, well, I don't need to remind myself of that now. I know how to do it. All you might need at the end of the day is to hold on to a candle and um, take a really big swig of the the hot sauce and the rest is done. Like, you know, it's as 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 you your spell crafting progresses, you will make changes. Some people go the opposite way. They add more and more and more. Um, and obviously, you know, because they like using certain tools that they feel should be there. Um, you know, I, I can think of a particular friend of ours um, that likes to really elaborate. Um, and they are, you know, his spell work is beautiful. Um, he doesn't need all of that, but it allows him the programming of getting himself into that mindset, storytelling of how he gets to that point. So, you know, whereas this is, you know, more complicated than it necessarily needs to be, but it's visually appealing. You can see the symbolism. You can understand what's going on. And for us as, as you know, diagnosticians, <laughs> uh, when it comes to looking at a spell after someone has done it and gone, what did I do wrong, um, is a case of going, well, actually, have you thought about the implications of using that? Have you thought about the implications of where you put that on top of this um, in order to make that happen? So, you know, again, like Liam says, this is quite a, a complex, in, unne as in kind of unnecessarily complex for someone um, further down the line. But with this is kind of, you know what it's on the tin. You look straight at that and you go, I'm about to curse some, you know, I'm about to hex somebody is obvious from that piece. Beautifully done, Liam. Well done. Yeah, so this is the sort of thing that you will find on YouTube channels, on blogs, in magical books and stuff like that. And it's kind of like if you remember at school in maths, they used to get you to show your work in out. Yeah. To reach a conclusion. You can look at this and you can see, like you said, the symbolism. But the purpose is when you want to advance in magic, you may find that you need the extra power, the extra ingredients that you're adding to this in order to make it work. Now, what we yeah. say when we teach, of course, is that all of these tools and things like that, no, they're not necessary. And it's our job as when we're mentoring to start taking these away. So if you've got this and you've done it successfully, the next thing to do is to start taking it apart. So if you are going to take such things apart, well, what are you going to do? OK, so at the end of the day, I've got written down exactly what I want to happen and how I wanted it to happen. So what I could say is, well, really, all this is is just a piece of paper. If that's in my head and I know exactly that and I've got it very clear in my head what I need to do, the next thing to go when you do this spell next is don't do the piece of paper. OK, mm. now, if you think that there's a lot of flames here and a lot of energy and stuff like that, and you think, well, actually, I'm focusing in and the energy that I'm using is coming from me directed in the eyes of that skull, which I'm seeing as the person I don't like, the Raven Grimsby. So the next thing to go is, well, actually, these helper. Do I need the additional? Often candles. gets referred to as helper candles. I don't need them. So the next time I do it, I'm not going to use that to the point where what you've got now is you've got your focal point. So, yes, you can stare at something that you can channel the anger at. You're also burning something down. But then you've got the added magical ingredients. And yes, if you're not capable of producing all of the power to have an effect, then you may need to use extra magical ingredients or... 
if you're not willing as is i think that is quite a popular thing with us i think we might not be willing to hex someone so what me we might mm -hmm. do is create things that don't use our own magic we might create magical ingredients and group them together that we know have a natural charge to such things yeah so the next example that you could have with something like this is literally well if you don't want the skull from the fancy witchcraft shop then all you do is you buy a slightly cheaper candle in which case well what have you got you've got a dish with some magical ingredients on it with a candle that you burn down well if you can do that you don't need to have bought all of the other stuff or added all of the other stuff for it to happen now, if we'd remove the next part again, you could be thinking, well, actually, I'm capable of powering this spell myself. I don't need these extra magical ingredients that are pre-charged, pre-packaged. So what are you left with? Now? You're just left with the one candle. And does it even need to be a red candle? Can I literally no. just say, well, I'm removing it from whatever colour candle I've got? I've only got a yellow one. Yellow's happy, yeah. but it's not going to be happy in the case that I'm using it for. Hmm. So all of a sudden, you've well, got rid of all these ways magical There's ways to manipulate with colour, isn't there? Yeah, you've got rid of all of these magical correspondences. And it's an important thing when you're casting magical spells and things. If you look back and rewind this video, look at where we started. Would you be comfortable with using that? At what point? did you get to when you felt well actually i feel like this isn't a hex anymore i don't feel comfortable with this i don't feel that it's right mm. stop there now for a lot of people they'll have got to the point where it's the well that's okay you don't need to you you can use just the candle however when i replaced it with the happy candle that might be a sticking point for a lot of people because you can follow the logic of the symbology that speaks to the mind and the psyche, I think, to a certain extent from all of this and reduce it down to this. The problem sometimes arises is when you start to use rose quartz crystals to hex people instead of for love and such. These things that are kind of associated. You're pushing Hey, stop giving my secrets away. Yeah, you're pushing things out of the boundaries of that kind of thing. Um, I think we've covered a fair amount, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> and I know we'll have to break things down a little bit more um, as and when we go through these episodes and stuff like that. So if we've explained a basic simple spell and reduced the different components of the spell to the point where they're probably just comfortable with just using a candle, maybe even a white candle or a simple candle because they don't need that or maybe they want to use that. Okay. But there are other forms of candle magic, of course, as well. Um, two of the most popular that I think we should talk for the next five minutes or so is using the larger ones and such for creating portals and stuff for altars. Because yeah. larger ones obviously last longer. So that kind of open and closed symbology of the lights are on someone's home. Yeah. What about that? Well, they're popular for ancestral altars, aren't they, as well, which is, you know, we'll try and train somebody that's setting up something like that, that you have an on and off switch, because the last thing you want with a sacred space doesn't need to be ancestral altar, but any kind of altar space that you keep at home, you're going to, well, not even necessarily at home, but, you know, there is, that is, you need to have that kind of on off switch. The reason for that is you don't necessarily want grandma and great, great, great grandma um, getting involved in your business, particularly if, you know, your altar is in your bedroom, for example. You're not going to want them when you've got company. Um, you know, you're not necessarily going to want it happening in the uh, the living room while the children are playing. Like, you know, there might be particular times that you feel it inappropriate or not appropriate to actually have that space open and active and therefore you know it candles are a really great way of having a visual 
on off switch there are lots of other ways to do it but i think the candle is you know iconic for exactly that reason is you know it is a visual way of seeing okay lights are on people are welcome i've switched the light off get out of here i'm not interested anymore so you know there is that kind of very on off that is really appealing with candles and like i said I, most of the candle work i do is exactly that it's just candles that are around my house um, that when they are lit certain entities or certain spaces are live uh, you know it's like the red light it's the red live flashy button at the uh, the radio station okay we're live now we're we're transmitting um you know or well i could have gone for a different red light in that system couldn't i really but let, let's not go there um where we're open for business so uh, for me i tend to use big altar candles are what i spend most of my time on um unless like liam says we're packaging something up for somebody else um me personally um anybody that i'm mentoring and anyone i'm getting to use work we we like to get you to do work the reason for that is it's more personal you know how and you want it to manifest and you know we can discuss at length um what you think you should be using uh, but the basic formula will be there um and as soon as you understand the basic formula the idea is you cast one spell with us the rest of them you can do yourself and keep playing with that that formula until like you said we're at that point where it's just a regular candle that just says i'm working now hmm so the only thing we didn't cover, um, and there is a comment from uh, Catherine on there about ceramancy candles. Yeah, exactly. Um, and obviously we talk about, I don't see the point of reading a spell after it's happened. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously the hoodoo queen would, would disagree with us um, and probably say, like she said there, uh, need to have done the spell before you know have, have checked before and after the spell has been cast me personally once that you've opened pandora's box you're not needing to necessarily you know know where she's gone um you just wanting to know that actually well i've you know if you're going to do a reading for any kind of spellcraft we suggest that you do it before um you know you shouldn't have to read your spells after you've cast them if you've done that then you're in a position of going why um why would you have done that now obviously who do queen would say you need to know where the blockages were where they couldn't access like if you've not planned that into the beginning part of your spell of going you know i've done a surveillance i know that that person has these defenses up um then you're not practicing very well is what i'm going to say uh, which is rude and will probably come back at me, um, but essentially is, you know, at that point that where you've lit the fuse, you better make sure that it's going to hit your mark. Um, if you've not done the planning for that, that's your fault. There's no point reading about it afterwards. Um, you know, that's checking the gate after the bloody horse has bolted. You know, what's the point at that point? Um, you know, the only kind yeah. of reading that we would do would kind of go oh well, i expected it to go this way okay well talk us through your ingredients what was missing that's different that's it that's not a reading that is diagnosis of i should have, i thought it was going to work this way um and it hasn't worked that way i think i think the only thing we haven't mentioned is i always say we may have said it in the first episode um but n mentioning the whole idea of you know energy energy will flow in the easiest direction so if you can see that there is an easier way for that to happen chances are it's going to attempt that first um so you need to have prepared as part of your spell planning um that you've avoided that option but anyway you're going to now show me uh ceramancy candles because you well, like a, those and they're cool a couple of points there would be that we tend to think of things as single use or ongoing spells so if it's a single use spell that's a grenade you launch it and you throw it when you burn a little candle down that's single use 
if you've got an altar set up or you're not even using candles you're using a poppet or something like that that's ongoing you only ever need to do divination to find out whether your spell has worked for single use anyway now we say do it before to save you time messing it up for the simple reason that you need to be thinking about this as a plan so beginners think all I do is I do the spell and if it works hopefully it works now when you get into witch wars when you get into things where there are other opponents and such this is constantly changing and ever evolving so you don't use single use spells for that you don't let go of that balloon and let it do its business you have an active role in the continuously manipulating of that single use spells you've let go you need to keep an eye on what's going on the way you do that is divination so afterwards people do the kind of divinations of did it work did it not work beforehand people confuse finding out whether it worked and actually it's not so much that it's more of a case of you're still at the design stage this is um what i would say in computer science and stuff is kind of beta testing what you're doing is you're creating a, you haven't cast the spell yet but you're assuming that you are you're fixing the fact that you're going down this route and you're definitely going to do it and see what effect that would have and then you're reprogramming your spell to compensate for what you see so if you're using divination such as tarot you might say i'm going to make this simple candle spell to hex someone i might use the divination the tarot to see did it work and it might come back now why won't it work well it seems that this the spell doesn't work because this person has a protection up okay if i did that divination afterwards i would have been told well the spell didn't work because of protection if i do it before i cast the spell i can say right scrap that idea readjust i need to recreate this spell and take into account this isn't going to work because of the protection okay what happens if i create more force what if i add more ingredients divination no that still doesn't work because the defenses are able you see you'd be wasting your time if you did your divinations afterwards what you want to do is use divination to help you form the spell in the first place okay that's where people go kind of wrong in terms of doing ongoing spells ongoing spells have an open link that you are accessing think of them like a rubber glove you put on and you know mangle you're continuously working with that because you're continuously working with that much like with a rubber glove you can feel what's going on so you don't need to do a, a divination on that because you're sensing it and you're feeling it if you work with a poppet and we will do poppet magic and stuff like that and you're working on this if you're doing it effectively and say you're hexing this pocket poppet which is raven grimsby this person that we were hexing earlier um you would be able to see it manifest within this puppet so if he has if you're sticking a pins in it or burning wax on it or putting him in a nasty place you'd be able to feel the energetic aura of this because you're actively working with it it's an open doorway okay with this puppet that you're working with continuously if you did a magical hex like with the skull and you just burnt it that would be a one use thing so you don't know because you've let go of that balloon but if you're talking about open doorways which we will go into more in the future because i know this is complicated then you may feel that divination is important but it's way more important beforehand than after i mean how many times do you think engineers and such get it all right first time well yeah, exactly. the reason why a lot of the times they do get things right is because they've done prototypes and they've yeah, done they testing in a synthesized 
virtual reality. Well, that's what divination is at the end of the day. So in terms of using candles now for divination purposes, we've got the idea of flickering candle flames and such. You've got the idea of wax reading, but the popular thoughts of reading the remnants of candles and the remnants of spells is flawed for the simple reason that A, if I used a glass candle with wax in it, physics, I mean, come on, depending on if it's a windy room, if it's that or if it's this, or how the candle was made, you don't know what impacts that's going to make. Yeah, and there's chances with, it's going to go boom. You take that risk when you buy the glass candle. Yeah, with that in mind, because we know people love to read candles and candle wax, we've tried to compensate for this by creating our own candle that is designed for one purpose, and that is for candle wax readings. So in terms of candle wax readings and how that works, if you go on the Witchcraft Live Facebook group, uh, Facebook group, we do have an actual video all on it, which shows you about different types of candle readings, but also explains these. But essentially what you're doing is you're reading the leftover remnants of wax. Now these ones were specifically designed as beeswax with a large wick. What that means is that as they burn, the liquid inside, uh, the wax inside becomes very hot and liquid. Because of the way the wick is, at some point, this candle will burst and all of the contents will pull out. Now, if you want to see the Saramancy video where this actually happens, you can actually look on the product page of the thofwitchcraft.com website. So on the Saramancy candles, they come in different colors. These are the ones we make. They're designed to look like a kind of old Victorian candle that's leaking. Um, but they pull and they go into different shapes and things like that. And all, each one will be different. It's a lot easier to read something like that than just your average kind of standard candle, remnants of a candle. Um, anything that you want to add to that, Chris? Because I know we're going a little over time. <laughs> I know we've gone over again. This is going to keep happening. But, you know, and we haven't even had questions really this time. So no. God help us in the future. Um, but is the case, uh, I suppose, is that we started with <laughs> Secrets of the Black Flame Candle and we focused on candle magic, as we hoped. Um, and I didn't get to talk about um, dead men's pans of glory and things. Oh, so we might we have to do a whole our, new episode on that. Yeah, we didn't cover uh, Hand of Glory. But maybe no. we'd get told off if we covered that. Possibly, but we can talk about that next time or a time okay. after that. Maybe we'll, we could we'll find an entire episode place. dedicated to such macabre, nasty things. Mm -hmm. Now, like if anyone that. would like to make a request for something for us to cover, bear in mind we're trying to keep it to the basics, but we don't necessarily have to. We're just trying to take into account that with this and the platform that we're on, there are a lot of different people that are on this platform. So some not people are going to be a lot them. more experienced than others. I know on other platforms that we're on, we normally tend to try to go by the people that are on. So like in the Witchcraft Live Facebook group, it's all beginners in No Holds Barred yeah. and that it's more advanced people. We try to stick that. With this, essentially, a lot of the time we're answering your questions and just giving you a little bit of a, a taster of certain subjects. So... If you want us to cover something, then please let us know. Let us know. But I think that's about it. So is there anything else that I need to no, I think, <laughs> say? No, like I say, I think that's a safe place to start. Um, and obviously we can do more advanced candle magic videos in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, we can definitely cover things macabre like Hands of Glory and the uh, truth behind the black, hand, the black flame candle. But um in future episodes but yeah just let us know what you want um and you know we're easy enough to find so just come and find us yeah and of course buy loads of stuff from the thofwitchcraft.com website obviously obviously <laughs> obviously that's dying Liam. <laughs> we need to put food on the table it's important <laughs> yeah. i've got cats to feed hmm yes so 
this week as well, please remember if you're taking part in our little Witch Wars competition, then you need to be getting that done by the end of this week because our good friend making an appearance. Um, he will be making an appearance on Sunday on the Ask a Witch uh, show. So make sure you do all your spell casting and stuff. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to go to the Witchcraft Live Facebook group. So, you know, I'll just leave it at that. So goodbye. And I think that's it, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> If you're tired of all the neo-pagan claptrap that's on the internet and want to see some real witchcraft, please subscribe to the Foff TV YouTube channel. If you really want to kick things up a notch, try clicking the No Holds Barred podcast link.